do Allah muna roƙon mutanen da annan su jaye kai kai mallan dawo 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 do Allah ba a gittawa wurin nan kada wanda ya sake gittawa don Allah sannan do Allah a jaye wadanda ke can su gani please for the sake of our seated brothers and sisters we should either sit down or change for this please Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillah was salatu was salam ala rasulillah wa ala ali wa sahbihi ajmain amma ba'd a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim wa qul jaal haqq wa zaqal batil innal batila kana zahuka rabbi shalli sadri wa yassirli amri wa hallul 'uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli donable sultan muhammad abu bakr the sultan of sokoto and the religious leader of more than 100 million muslims of nigeria the governors the respected dignitaries and my dear brothers and sisters i welcome all of you with the islamic greetings assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh may peace mercy and blessings of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you before I start my presentation of the day, I would like to speak for a few minutes regarding our dear brothers and sisters in Palestine. Most of us are, most of us are aware of the history of Palestine. Hitler incinerated six million Jews. It was a holocaust. Many of these Jews they took shelter in Palestine. And our Muslim brothers in Palestine, they welcomed them with open hearts. They welcomed their cousins, the Jews, with open hearts. Come and take shelter in our home. They welcomed them. But what happened? Many years later, these same people who were welcomed by the Muslim brothers in Palestine, they take them out of their own home. They occupy their home. And when the Muslim brothers are crying, please give a home back, they are calling them as terrorists. And this is common. You see this happening many places in the world. We know that the Britishers, the French, the Portuguese, they occupied more than two thirds of the world especially the Britishers, they occupied many parts of the world. They came to my country, India, and they called Bhagat Singh. When Bhagat Singh tried to take them out of India, they called him as the biggest terrorist at that time. They occupied USA, America, and when George Washington fought again for the freedom of the country, the Britishers called George Washington as terrorist number one. We know the history of South Africa. Nelson Mandela, when he fought for his freedom, he was called as terrorist number one and imprisoned in Robben Island for more than 25 years. But we Indians, we call Bhagat Singh as a freedom fighter, not a terrorist. The Americans, they call George Washington not as a terrorist, but as one of the greatest freedom fighter. The South Africans, they call Nelson Mandela not as a terrorist, but one of the greatest freedom fighter. Same way today, when our Muslim brothers in Palestine, they are doing they are protecting only a state of Islam and fighting for the freedom most of the world. them as freedom fighters they protect the land and we know today in the last one month they the israelis have been doing atrocity for decades for more than 50 years in the last one month they have killed thousands of innocent palestinians women children 
we condemn this genocide and we ask the world to tell israel to stop this genocide we pray for our palestinian brothers and sisters that may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant jannah to the people who have been martyred may allah give them sabr to sustain this may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them victory and raise them in jannat firdaus but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's easy for him to solve this problem what is allah doing he's testing us and i'll cover this in my talk allah is testing us and the palestinians alhamdulillah most of them will get flying colors but what about us muslims what are we doing i gave a speech on the 13 action points for the muslim umma as far as palestine is concerned i don't intend giving this talk now time is short i have to finish my speech in 1 hour that's the time limit led by me 1 hour i started at 1 o'clock i have to finish by 2 o'clock allah is testing us what are we muslims doing they will pass with flying colors they are doing fardi kafaya what are we muslims all over the world doing are we doing a job please do listen to my talk on 13 point act 13 action points for the muslim umma for palestine <clears throat> the sultan had invited me for this program more than 3 months back and after i accepted the invitation to come on 2nd of november my lawyers told me that there is a important case going on in malaysia you have to attend on 2nd of november i said no i have given the word to the sultan i cannot cancel my trip and today morning few hours back was the hearing the final and verdict of the case i had sued i had filed a dimish i had filed a defamation case against rama swami who is the deputy chief minister of penang he was because he insulted me 4 years ago in august 2019 i gave a talk in klantan a state in malaysia and mashallah there were more than 100000 people for my talk it was the largest religious gathering in malaysia mashallah a foreigner coming and giving a talk in klantan more than 100000 people gathered and the chief minister gave me the award dai of the umma the non muslim enemies of islam they could not digest it few days after the talk they started blaming me zakir is the terrorist zakir is the hate preacher so what i did i picked up the five most important people who maligned me and most of them all of them were politicians one what i did i sued them in the court of law when i sued them one person was a cabinet minister of human resources second person was a deputy chief minister of penang one person was member of parliament fourth person and the fifth person they were member of assembly all politicians all of them of indian origin maligning me what i did i filed the suit against them they told who is this foreigner when we criticize the prime minister no one does the case against us who is this foreigner who is suing us allah blessed most of them they did the outside court settlement with me and they apologized to me i said no problem but the biggest enemy of islam who i call i did not forgive him i said we let the court case go on the court case went for 2 years and today morning was the verdict today morning few hours before the verdict was there and the judge told told rama sami who was at that time the deputy chief minister of penang to pay a fine of 1.52 million malaysian ringgit to dr zakir naik as compensation 1. 52 malaysian ringgit is equivalent to 320000 us dollars it is equal to 383 million naira if 1 dollar is 1200 naira then the judge of high court ordered ramaswami 
to pay Dr. Zakir Naik within 30 days 1.52 million ringgit, which is equal to 320,000 US dollars, which is equal to 383 million naira. And I today, I pledge this amount, this complete amount for the cause of Palestine. I want to donate this full amount. This is the least I can do. This complete amount of 1.52 million ringgit, 320,000 US dollars, 383 million naira, I pledge it as a donation to the Palestinian cause for our brothers and sisters in Palestine. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this verdict just came few hours before, today early morning. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he grant the martyr than the firdos. May he give sabr to the brothers and sisters in Palestine. May he give them istiqama. And inshallah, inshallah, victory will be ours. Surely, Allah is testing us. Are we following the Quran or not? Today, the topic of my presentation. First, I'd like to thank the Sultan to invite me as the guest speaker for the closing ceremony of the 10th Sheikh Usman bin Faidu week, 1445 after Hijri, which is 2023 Christian era. I would like to thank him. It's a pleasure and an honor for me to come here to the state of Sokoto. It is the second time I'm coming to Nigeria after 10 years, and this is the first time I'm coming to the state of Sokoto. And I'm really impressed. I'm really impressed by the state of Sokoto, mashallah. I'm told more than 99% are Muslims. And I'm happy to meet the leader of more than 100 million Muslims in Nigeria, the Sultan of Sokoto. The topic of today's presentation is Al-Quran, the global necessity. Al-Quran, is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which was revealed to the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. <clears throat> Allah says in the glorious Quran in Surah Rod chapter number 13 verse number 38 in every age have we sent a revelation, have we sent a book. By name, four revelations are mentioned in the Quran. Torah, Zabur, Injil, and the Quran. Torah is the wahi which was given to Prophet Moses, peace be upon him. Zabur is the wahi which was given to David, peace be upon him. Injil was the wahi, the revelation given to Jesus, peace be upon him. Glorious Quran is the last and final revelation given to the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. But there were many other revelations besides this. For example, Sufi Ibrahim and many others. As the Quran says, in every age have we sent a revelation. But all the revelations that came before the Quran, they were meant only for a particular time period and was meant only for a particular time period. But since the glorious Quran is the last and final revelation, it was not meant only for the Muslims or the Arabs, it was meant for the whole humanity. And it is meant till the last day of judgment. Allah says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 1, Alif Lam Ra, we have given this book to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to guide humanity from darkness to light. Not to guide the Muslims or the Arabs, but to guide the whole of humanity from darkness to light. Allah says in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 52, here is the message for mankind. Let them take warning therefrom. Let them know there is one God. Let the men of understanding take heed. Allah repeats the message in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 185. Ramadan is the month in which the Quran was revealed as a guidance to humanity. Allah repeats the message in Surah Az-Zumur, chapter 39, verse 41. That this is a message given to thee to instruct humankind. Given to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not to instruct only the Muslims or the Arabs, but to instruct the whole of humanity. This glorious Quran was revealed for the whole of humanity. 
the glorious Quran, it is the future world constitution. It is the most positive book in the world. It is a proclamation to humanity. It is a fountain of mercy and wisdom. It's a warning to the heedless. It's a guide to the erring. It's an assurance to those in doubt. It's a solace to the suffering. It's a hope to those in despair. Because the Quran is the future world constitution, it is a global necessity. Because the Quran is the most positive book in the world, the Quran is a global necessity. Because the Quran is the proclamation to humanity, the glorious Quran is a global necessity. Because the Quran is the fountain of mercy and wisdom, Al Quran is a global necessity. Because the Quran is the guidance to humanity, it is a global necessity. Because the Quran is a warning to the heedless, the glorious Quran is a global necessity. Because the Quran is an assurance to those in doubt, Al Quran is the global necessity. Because the Quran is a solace to the suffering, Al Quran is a global necessity. Because the Quran is a hope to those in despair, Al Quran is a global necessity. Whenever you have any equipment, a lot of equipment comes and the more complicated the equipment, the more of an instruction manual so that how to use equipment if you allow me to call a human being a machine i would say it is the most complicated machine in the world it is more complicated than the high computer in the world don't you think we require a instruction manual the human being with complicated machine if you allow me to call it a machine more than the most advanced company in the world, don't you think it requires an instruction manual? The instruction manual, for the thing, it is the glorious Quran. The glorious Quran is the last and final instruction manual revealed by the creator of the human being, that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, it is Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. As I told you earlier, that Allah is testing us. For Allah, it's very easy. For Allah to make the Palestinian win over Israel, it's kun fayakun. Allah is testing us. Are they struggling and striving for the cause of Allah? Allah is testing all the human beings in the world. Are you standing for the truth? So this life, according to the glorious Quran, is the test for the hereafter. If we pass this test, we go to Jannah, paradise. If we fail, we go to hell, we go to Jahannam. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Dhar, chapter 51, verse 56, that we have created the jinn and the human beings not worship me. What is the purpose of our life? Why are we here? Have we ever thought, what are we doing here? Allah gives the answer in Surah Dariya, chapter 15, verse 56. Allah has created and the men not but to worship him. So we are in this world as a test for the hereafter. Our role, our purpose is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I've given a talk and you should see this lecture of mine, what is the purpose of creation? When we obey the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are doing ibadah. We are worshipping him. If we follow the commandments, we are worshipping him. If we stay away from things he has prohibited, we are worshipping him. Ibadah means following Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First we have to understand the concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'll be dealing in detail in my talk on Friday, Halloween. 
the concept of one major world religion. But the best reply that any Muslim can give you regarding the definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Surah Ikhlas, chapter 112, verse number one to four, where Allah says, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Say he's Allah one and only. Allahu samad. Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not nor is he begotten. Walam yakullahu kuffan ahad. There's nothing like him. This is a four line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran in Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, verse number one and four. Verse number one to four. If any person says so and so entity is God, if he fits in this four line definition of Surah Ikhlas, we Muslims have no objection in accepting that entity as Allah, as God. The first is, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Say he's Allah one and only. Number two, Allahu samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. Lam yirad wa lam yulad. He begets not nor is he begotten. Wa lam yakul lahu kufana. There's nothing like him. This surah class is the touchstone of theology. It is the touchstone of theology. Theo means God. Logic means study. Theology, study of God. And touchstone, you know, when you go to buy and sell gold jewelry, you go to a goldsmith and you want to verify how pure is the gold. So the goldsmith takes the gold and rubs it against the touchstone. And depending upon the color, he tells you whether this gold is 24 karat gold, whether 22 karat gold, whether 18 karat gold, or it may not be gold at all, because all that glitters is not gold. So Surah class is the touchstone of theology. The God you are worshipping, you put into the test of Surah class. If the God you are worshipping passes the test of Surah class, he is a true God. If he fails the test, he is a false God. You know, there are some people, some human beings, who say, who claim, Bhagawan Rush needs to be God. Some people, I didn't say Hindus, Hinduism doesn't say that Bhagawan Rajneesh is God, but there are some human beings, many of them, who claim Bhagawan Rajneesh to be God. Let's put this Bhagawan Rajneesh to the test of Surah class. Let us put Bhagwan Rashni to the test of Surah class. Kul huwa Allahu ahad. Test number one. Say is Allah one and only. Is Bhagwan Rashni one? There are thousands of men who have claimed to be God, especially the country where I come from, India. There are thousands of men who say they are God. Is he the only one? No. The second test. Allah hu samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. We know from the biography of Rashni that Bhagwan Rashni he was suffering from asthma, from diabetes mellitus, from chronic backache. Imagine Almighty God suffering from asthma, from diabetes mellitus, from chronic backache. The third test. Lam yalad wa lam yulad. He begets not nor is he begotten. And we know that Bhagavan Rajnish, he was born and he had a mother and father who later on became his own disciple. He was born in Jabalpur in India and his parents became his own disciple. In May 1981, Bhagwan Rajnish goes to USA. And in the state of Oregon, he starts his own center called as Rajnish Puram. And thousands of Americans and Europeans gather there. Later on, the American government arrests him and puts him in prison. Bhagwan Rajnish claims that the American government gave me slow poisoning in spirit. In the prison, the American government gave me slow poisoning. Imagine, Almighty God me slow poisoning. And later on, in 1985, he is kicked out of America and he comes back to India and in the city of Pune, in the state of Maharashtra, where I live, in the city of Pune, he starts the center finish Neo Sanyas. And later on, he calls the Osho commune. If you go to a center Osho commune, he has thousands of Europeans and Westerners from all over the world. When you go to his Osho commune, 
in the samadhi, you know, when the Hindus die, they put the ashes and they make a samadhi. On a samadhi, it's mentioned, Osho Rajnish, never born, never died, but visited the earth from the 11th of December, 1931, to the 19th of January, 1990. Never born, never died, but visited the earth from the 11th of December, 1931, to the 19th of January, 1990. They forgot to mention in his samadhi that he was not given visas to 22 different countries of the world. Almighty God coming to visit the world and he requires visas to go to different countries. And the Archbishop of Greece said, if you don't take out Rajneesh and his followers from this country, we'll burn his house and the house of his disciples. And the last test, the fourth test, is so stringent that no one beside true Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can pass. There's nothing like him. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, he's not God. We know Rajnish, like the normal human being. He had two hands, two legs, one nose, two eyes, a long beard. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, he's not God. Suppose someone says that Bhagwan, suppose someone says that God is thousand times stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger. You heard the name Arnold Schwarzenegger, the person who got the title Mr. Universe, strongest man in the world. If someone says Almighty God is thousand times stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger, the moment you can compare God to anyone, whether it be Arnold Schwarzenegger, whether it be King Kong, whether it be Dara Singh, the moment, whether it is thousand times or million times, the moment you can compare God to anything in this world, he is not God. There's nothing like him. This is the four line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to find out whether he's true God or not. So I request all the people, check up the God you're worshipping. If it passes the test of Surah Ikhlas, the true God. Otherwise, it's a fake God. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 48, that Allah forgiveth not associating partners with him. Anything else, if he pleases, he may forgive. For anyone who associates partners with Allah, he has created a grave, heinous sin. Allah repeats the message in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 116. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forgive anyone joining gods with him. Any other sin, if he pleases, he may forgive. For anyone who joins God with Allah, he has strayed away far. So shirk is the biggest sin in Islam. It is the biggest sin. It is the number one major sin. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Hajj, chapter number 22, verse number 73, all those who you call upon besides Allah, if they gather together, listen to this parable, the verse starts, listen to this parable, that all those who you worship besides Allah, if you call them, and if all of them gather together besides Allah, to create a fly, they will not be able to do it. And if the fly snatches away something, they will not be able to get it back. Feeble are those who petition, and feeble are those to whom they petition. Allah is telling in the Quran that all the false god that you worship. You know, according to Hindu scriptures in Hinduism alone, there are, 300, there are 33 crow gods. That means 330 million gods. If all the religions put together, there are hundreds of millions of God. Allah is telling here in this verse of the Quran, if all these people who you worship besides Allah, these hundreds of millions of gods, false gods, that you worship besides Allah, if they gather together to create a fly, they will not be able to do it. And the verse continues, if the fly snatches something away, they won't even be able to get it back. They decide to create a fly, they cannot even get back if the fly snatches something from them. Feeble, weak are those people who pray to them and weak are those people to whom they pray.
because the glorious Quran explains to us the concept of true Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Quran is a global necessity. The Quran talks about Salah. In English, people normally translate Salah as prayer. Prayer, if you open the dictionary, means to beseech, to ask for help. According to me, prayer is not the appropriate translation of the Arabic word Salah. What we do dua after the Salah, that is prayer. The Salah is far superior to praying. In the Salah, besides asking for help, we are getting guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Arabic word Salah comes from the root word Salah, means connection. The servant connects with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Salah means connecting to God. I call it the programming towards righteousness. When we pray, we read Surah Fatiha, after that, Imam is telling us. He's giving us guidance. Don't lie. Don't cheat. Five times a day, we are being programmed towards righteousness. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah an Kabut, chapter 29, verse 45. Utlu ma uhiya salata tanha anil wal munkar. Recite of what we have revealed to thee of the Quran and establish Salah. For Salah restrains you from shameful and unjust deed. That means Salah keeps you on the straight path. It prevents you from shameful and unjust deed. It prevents you from sin. So if you offer Salah correctly, you will be on the straight path. Because Salah, because the Quran teaches us about Salah, the Quran is a global necessity. The Quran speaks about zakat. It is the third pillar of Islam. That every rich human being, every rich Muslim, who has the saving of more than the nisab level, more than 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of that excess wealth. Every lunar year in charity. If every rich human being in the world gives zakat, gives this 2.5% charity, Poverty will be eradicated from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. And there are several surahs of the Quran, multiple times. Aqimu salah, wa'atu zakah. Establish salah and give your zakah. Multiple times in the Quran. Surah Baqra, Surah Imran, Surah Nisa. The Quran talks about the fourth pillar of Islam, Psalm. That every adult Muslim who has the health and is not traveling, it's compulsory that he fasts in the month of Ramadan. He abstains from drinking or eating food and sex from dawn till sunset in the complete month of Ramadan. I call Ramadan as the overhauling of the human body. Like when you have a car or a motorcycle, you require to service it. Maybe every six months, every year. Similarly, if you call this human being a machine, it requires servicing at least once a year for one month. If you can abstain from smoking from dawn to sunset, you can very well abstain from smoking from the cradle to the grave. If you can abstain from drinking alcohol from dawn to sunset, very well you can abstain from having alcohol from the cradle to the grave. Ramzan is a month which encourages you to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It encourages you to do good deeds and it encourages you to stop the evil deed. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 183, Ramzan Allah says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 183 that fasting was prescribed to you as it was prescribed to people before you so that you may learn self-restraint, so that you may learn taqwa, so that you may learn God consciousness, so that you may learn piety. So the main reason our creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed us to fast for one month in the month of Ramadan is so that we 
attain taqwa, righteousness, God consciousness, piety. The glorious Quran speaks about the fifth pillar, that is Hajj. It is compulsory for every adult Muslim who has health and has the economic means that at least once in his lifetime he should perform Hajj, the pilgrimage, in the month of Hajj from 8th to the 13th of Zilijjah and travel to the city of Makkah, the state of Makkah, Mina, Arafa, Muzdalifa, back to Mina and Makkah in the six days from 8th to the 13th of Zilaj. And there's a full surah by the name Surah Hajj, chapter 22 in the Quran. And this Hajj is the biggest annual gathering in the world where more than 4 million people gather from different parts of the world, from USA, from Canada, from UK, from Pakistan, from India, from Saudi Arabia, from Nigeria, from Ghana, from different parts of the world. And the men, they are dressed in two pieces of unsewn cloth. You cannot identify the person next to you whether he's a king or a pauper. All equal in the sight of Allah. Labbaik, Allahumma labbaik. Labbaik, Allahumma labbaik. Here I am, O oh my Lord, at your service. It is the best example of universal brotherhood in the world. Whether black or white, yellow or brown, two pieces of unsewn cloth, all equal in the sight of Allah. Because the glorious Quran teaches us about Salah, about Psalm, about Zakat, about Hajj, I say Al-Quran is a global necessity. The Quran gives us the criteria for a person to go to Jannah, to attain salvation. <clears throat> Allah says in Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, Wal Asr, Inna al-insana la fi khusr, illa ladhina amanu, wa aminu salihati, wa tawasaw bil haqqi, wa tawasaw bil sabr. That by the token of time, Man is verily in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who do righteous deed, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. Those who have faith, those who have righteous deed, those who exhort people to truth, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. These minimum four criteria are required for any human being to go to, go to Jannah. Number one is Iman having faith. Number two, amal salihat righteous deed. Number three, watawasaw bil haq, inviting people to truth, doing dawa and islah. And number four, watawasaw bil sabr, inviting people to patience and perseverance. If any one of these criteria is missing, under normal circumstances, you shall not go to Jannah. All four criteria are equally important. Iman, righteous deed, dawa, and inviting people to patience and perseverance. So Quran gives you the formula to attain Jannah, to go to paradise. Because Quran gives you the formula to go to Jannah, to attain paradise, I said Al-Quran is a global necessity. A beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number seven, hadith number 7417, the Prophet said, this world is a prison for the believers. And it is paradise for the unbelievers. There's incidents that once Hafiz Ibn Hajar Askalani, may Allah have mercy on him, he was a great scholar. He wrote the Sharah of Bukhari, the second most important book after the Quran. When he was going in the marketplace with his entourage, he was the chief Kazi and people, a poor Jew. He comes and he catches the mule of Hafiz ibn Hajar Askalani. Rahimullah. And he tells him, I heard that your prophet said, this world is a prison for the believers and it is paradise for the unbelievers. You, you are so rich, you are leading a luxurious life, I am a poor man. He was wearing torn clothes. How can you explain 
the hadith of your prophet that this world is a prison for believer like you who are so rich and living comfortably and it's a paradise for a poor person unbeliever like me who's poor with torn clothes the hafiz ibn hajar asqalani says that i know what's going to happen in the future and i know that in akhira in the next life for the believers we will get paradise and if you compare the jannah to this world what i'm living compared to the jannah it is billion times better this world with all the wealth is a prison and i know the unbelievers like you who do not believe in allah in the next life they will go to jahannam and the jahannam will be so bad that even if you are the poorest man in the world if you compare to jahannam your this life will be like paradise compared to jahannam so this is the explanation of the hadith of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam asay muslim volume 7 hadith number 7417 that you may be the richest man in the world you may have the maximum luxury but compared to the luxury of akhira in jannah it will be a billion times better <clears throat> so if you compare the difference between the poorest man who goes to jannah and the richest man in the world going to jannah the difference is very less so this world you should not be bothered whether you are poor or rich whether you are king or a pauper you should be bothered that you pass the test because the jannah and the prophet said it is more easier for the poor man to go to jannah than a rich man because the rich man has to give hisab kitab he has to give accountability of everything more difficult <clears throat> so comparatively it is billion times better than the richest man in the world and compared to the poor man also it is a billion times hardly any difference and the jannah is so worse the description given in the quran and the hadith even if you are the poorest man in this world it will be like paradise the fire when it comes on your feet your brains will boil can you believe so this is the explanation and this quran it prevents you to go from jahannam going to jahannam and encourages you to go to jannah that is the reason i call the glorious quran a global necessity I'm sorry I'm straining my voice because <clears throat> the public address system is not up to the standard <clears throat> and I'm speaking to the commission of religious affairs day face today that when a mujahid goes to the battlefield his weapon is required for a dai when he's giving a lecture my weapon is the microphone system you may find my voice to be good no i the professional and if i modulate better the impact of my lecture becomes 10 times more 50 times more but alhamdulillah this microphone is better than yesterday's <laughs> alhamdulillah <clears throat> and believe me hiring a good microphone system is not expensive but unfortunately we muslim are not well versed with what's required inshallah we will educate ourselves and i gave a talk to the dais of sokoto more than 100 were there mashallah it was wonderful meeting them mashallah now continuing with the talk the glorious quran has the solutions to the problems of human kind because the glorious quran has the solution to all the problems of human kind i say al quran is a global necessity al quran is the furqan allah refers to the quran as furqan the criteria to judge right from wrong al quran has the solution to the problem of racism one of the biggest problem in the world today is racism allah gives the solution in surah hujurat chapter number 49 verse number 13 allah says ya ayyuhan nasu inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha wa jalnakum 
شعو بو قباء الى لتعرفوا ان قرمكم من الله يتقاكم ان الله عليم خبير او يو من كاين وي هاف كرييتد يو فروم ا سينجل بير اوف ميل اند فيميل اند هاف ديفايدد يو انتو نيشنز اند ترايبس سو ذات يو شال ريكوجنايز ايتش اذر نوت ذات يو شال ديسبايس ايتش اذر اند ذا موست اونرد ان ذا سايت اوف الله سبحانه وتعالى از ذا بيرسون هو هاز تقوى هو هاز جاد كونشسنس هو هاز بايتي هو هاز رايتشسنس the criteria for judgment in the sight of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the glorious quran it's not wealth it's not age it's not sex it's not color it is taqwa it is righteousness it is piety it's god consciousness according to the quran no black man is superior to a white man or a white man is superior to a black man no rich man is superior to a poor man or a poor man for rich man no male is superior to a female or a female to a male unless with one criteria taqwa righteousness god consciousness tawhid this one verse of the quran will solve all the problem of racism in the world if the humanity follows this our beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the last and farewell pilgrimage in the hajjatul wida he said that no arab is superior to a non arab no black or no non arab is superior to an arab a black man is a white man is not superior to a black man neither a black man is superior to a white man except by taqwa and we demonstrate this every day five times of our life every day in salah when we stand for salah we stand shoulder to shoulder feet to feet whether king or pauper black or white yellow or brown rich or poor when we stand for salah in front of allah we stand together it will abolish all kinds of racism in the world quran because it has the solution for racism i say al quran is a global necessity everyone in the world should know about the quran and follow it then only will there be peace al quran has the solution to terrorism one verse of the quran is sufficient for the major solution of terrorism allah says in the glorious quran in surah maida chapter number 5 verse number 32 if anyone kills any other human being unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity allah says in the quran if anyone whether muslim or non muslim kills any other innocent human being whether muslim or non muslim unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity and the verse does not stop the verse continues and if anyone saves any other human being whether muslim or non muslim if you save any innocent human being it is as though you have saved the whole of humanity this one verse of the quran is the major solution for terrorism the israelis they are killing thousands of innocent human beings if they follow the quran in islam in islam even when we go for war a beloved prophet said do not harm the women do not harm the children do not harm the elderly people who do not come to war do not cut down trees and whatever wrong information today you know israelis are giving wrong information what they are saying that hamas you know the palestinian are fighting for the freedom they killed 40 babies and they're showing video of it all fabrication biden is saying i saw with my own eyes that hamas killed 40 babies fabrication afterwards when you are exposed some other american says oh it was a mistake they are laying allegation that the palestinians are killing innocent civilians what information we have from the social media authentic information mashallah even when the palestinians are retaliating they are not attacking purposely any innocent human being they aren't attacking the women aren't attacking the children 
And we know of various incidents that when they go to the houses, they tell the women, we are Muslims, you are safe from us. And when they're hungry, when they attack the house, they keep the women safe. They even take permission. Can we please take a banana from your fridge? Can you believe? Someone is coming in your house to take back his house with arms and they're taking permission to have one banana. And when they go, when they retaliate the military of Israel and when they leave their homes, they leave the homes. And when they come and when they take food from their fridge, they leave a note, we are sorry, we ate food from your fridge. And then they go back. This is Islam. And now they are blaming them that they are terrorists. Today is the world, is a global village. By social media they are being exposed. They could fabricate about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. They spent $573 million to fabricate videos to show that Israel has weapons of mass destruction and after many years they say sorry, finish. They kill millions of Muslims in Iraq and now they say sorry, matter is over. Today, mashallah, it's a blessing that not only Muslims, the non-Muslims because of the social media, the majority are supporting the Palestinian cause. Though the major satellite channels, CNN, BBC, they are telling that the Palestinians are terrorists, but the social media is flooded with evidence. What they're doing is wrong. You see rallies all over the world. All over the world. In America, in Western countries, in European countries, in India, in Muslim countries, even in Nigeria, hundreds of thousands of people are protesting against the injustice. This is the power of social media. Islam has the solution for terrorism. Islam has the solution for injustice. Allah says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 135 that, Ya al amanu, O oh you believe, stand out for justice as witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even if it be against yourself, against your parents, against your relatives, with the rich or poor. When you are doing justice, don't look at him whether he's your friend, he's your mother or a father or your relative or rich or poor. As the beloved Prophet Muhammad said, By Allah, if my daughter Fatima robs, I will chop off her hand. This is justice. Justice. Islam has the solution for alcoholism and drug addiction. Allah says in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 90, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, innam al khamru al maysuru. Oh, you believe most certainly in toxic gifts and gambling. Well, ansabu wal aslamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rich to minimally shaitan. These are Satan's the handiwork. First, the handiwork of the frihun. Abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. In Islam, alcoholism, drug addiction, it is prohibited. You know, every day, every year, according to who? More than 4 million people die only because of alcoholism. You know, America, a few decades earlier, they tried to ban alcohol, knowing it's very bad for health. When they tried, the government collapsed. There was bootlegging, there was illegal alcohol, and the government collapsed. They again got back alcohol. 1400 years ago, our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa when he recited the verse of this Quran, Ya ayyuhaladzina amanu, innam al khamru al maysuru, most certainly intoxicated and gambling. Ya ayyuhaladzina amanu, innam al khamru al maysuru, oh you believe, most certainly intoxicated and gambling. Wal anzabu al aslamu, dedication of stone, divination of arrows, rich to manam in shaitan, these are Satan's handiwork. First, then you will come to Fliun. Abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. Just because the Prophet recited the verse of the Quran, barrels of alcohol were emptied in Medina, never to be filled again. What America, with all its power, could not do for many years, a Prophet did with just one word. One verse of the Quran he, re he recited, and the barrels of alcohol were emptied in Medina, never to be filled again. If Quran has the solution to the problem of of fornication, of adultery, of prostitution. 
Allah says in the Quran in Surah Isra chapter 17 verse 32, come not close to adultery for it's an evil opening other roads to evil. Come not close to adultery. Don't do adultery. Come not close to adultery because it's an evil opening other roads to evil. Quran has the solution to the problem of pornography, of immodesty, of obscenity. Islam and Quran and Hadith, they prescribe hijab. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nur chapter 20 verse number 30, it first speaks about hijab for the man. Ya Lidin Amun, oh you believe, lower your gaze and protect your modesty. Whenever a man looks at a woman and any brazen thought comes in his mind, he should lower his gaze. That is the hijab for the man. And for the woman, the next verse, Surah Nisa chapter 24 verse 31, say to the bleeding woman, she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty and display not her beauty except what appears ordinary of. There are basically six criteria for hijab given in the Quran and the Hadith. Number one is the extent. For the man, it's from the navel to the knee. For the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen are the face and hands up to the wrist. Some say that even the face should be covered. The remaining five criteria are the same for the man and the woman. The clothes they wear should not be tight fitting so that it reveals the figure. Number three, it should not be translucent or transparent so that you can see through the clothes. Number four, it should not be so glamorous so that it attracts the opposite sex. Number five, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. And number six, it should not resemble that of the unbelievers. These are the six criteria for hijab. And people ask me that why hijab should be done. I tell them that if there are two twin sisters who are very beautiful, equally beautiful, if they are walking down the streets of Sokoto and if one sister, one lady, she is wearing a, a complete hijab, Islamic hijab, complete body covered, only part seen is face and hand to the rest. And the second twin sister, she's a westerner wearing mini skirts or shorts with a low neck. And as they're walking down the streets of New York or Sokoto, and around the corner there is a hooligan who's waiting for a catch who, to tease a girl. Which girl will it tease? Will it tease the girl wearing the Islamic hijab or will it tease the girl wearing the Western clothes, mini skirts and shorts? Which girl will it tease? Which girl? <laughs> mini skirts, correct. Simple question, simple answer. Quran says in Surah Zumur chapter 39, Allah says in Surah Azab, chapter, chapter 33, verse 59, O Prophet, tell your wives and your daughters and the believing women, when they go abroad, they should put on the cloak so that they shall be recognized. So hijab has been prescribed to prevent the women from being molested, to protect them. So Quran has the solution for obscenity, for ease teasing, for pornography. Quran has the solution for the bribery and corruption. Allah says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 188, eat up not wealth amongst yourself or use it as a bait for judges in order that willfully, wrongfully you will eat other people's wealth. So giving money as bribe is prohibited in the Quran. Quran has the solution for economy. Allah says in no less than eight places, riba has been prohibited. And Allah says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 278 and 279 about riba, about interest, that those who give up not the demands of riba, demands of interest and usury, take notice of a war from Allah and his Rasul. That means Allah and his Rasul will wage a war against you if you deal in riba. It is the 12th major sin in Islam, according to Imam Adabi in his book, The Kabair, the major sin. Quran has the solution for all the problems. Whether it be an individual problem, whether it be a family problem, whether it be a society problem, whether it be a national problem, whether it be a global problem. Quran has the solution for all the problems. Therefore, I say Quran is a global necessity. Quran has a solution, solution to the problem, whether it be social problem, whether it be psychological problem, whether it be economical problem, whether it be political problem. Because Quran has the solution to all the problems. Quran is a global necessity. 
I would like to end my speech by giving one more message of the Quran, which I mentioned earlier, that one of the criteria to go to Jannah is Dawa. And I'll, give, I'll be giving a talk in Abuja on the 5th of November on Sunday, Dawa or destruction. Muslim choice, Dawa or destruction. You do Dawa, otherwise you'll be destroyed. I'll just quote one verse of the Quran of Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse 110, where Allah says, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat lin nas. Oi, Muslims, you are the best of peoples evolved for mankind. Allah is giving us an honor and calling us the best of people. There is no honor without responsibility. Don't you think we have a responsibility? Allah continues to say, Ta'mruna bil ma'arufi wa tanhauna anil munka. Because we enjoy what is good and we forbid what is wrong and we believe in Allah. If we do not enjoy what is good and if we do not forbid what is wrong, we aren't fit to be called as khaira ummah, we aren't fit to be called as Muslims. Doing dawah is part of every Muslim. Otherwise, you should not go to, go to Jannah. Only praying, fasting, hajj is not sufficient. According to Surah Al-Asr, if you don't do dawah, you shall not enter Jannah. I would like to end my speech with the verse of the Quran, which is repeated three times. It's mentioned in Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse number 33. And Surah Fatah, chapter number 48, verse number 28. And Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 9. هُوَ الَّذِي أَرْثَلَ الرَّسُولُ بِالْهُدَىٰ وَالدِّينُ الْحَقِّ لِيُوزِرَ وَالَدِّينِ قُلِّهِ Allah sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other religions, all the other isms, whether it be communism, atheism, Christianism, Hinduism, Judaism, Islam is destined to supersede all. قُلِّهِ Overcome them all. And Allah says in two places, how much the mushrik don't like it? And one place Allah says that and enough is Allah is a witness. Allah does not require you and me the rubbish that we are. Allah does not require you and me to solve the problem of the Palestine. He can do within seconds kun fa kun. Allah is giving us an opportunity to earn Jannah. Allah is seeing what you are going to do for the cause of a Palestinian brothers and sisters. Allah has given us this all the luxury the clothes, the food we eat. What are we doing for our brothers in Palestine, for our sisters in Palestine? I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he grant them Jannah and give them sabr and give them victory over the Zalimun. Wa akhir dawan, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Allahu Akbar. That was a one-hour lecture titled Quran, the Global Necessity, delivered by Dr. Zakir Naik. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ma farratna fil kitab min shay. Jazakumullahu khair. Your Excellencies, without Taking much time, we'll invite His Eminence the Sultan for his address. Allahu Akbar. Your Excellency is the governors of Sokoto, Kebi, Zamfara, especially the governor of Kebi personally here, deputy governor of Zamfara, representing the governor, and our own SSG representing the governor of Sokoto, our most distinguished chairman of this program, the Emir of Zazao, our most distinguished guest speaker, 
Dr. Zakiru Naik, our most distinguished recipients of the award today, our most prominent and most distinguished audience, the ladies and gentlemen in the house, and those listening across the world, because this program is streamed live across the world. I greet you in the best form of greeting. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, as the main person of the day, so this program is the closing ceremony of Sheikh Uthman bin Fodio week happened to, by the grace of Almighty Allah, be the Khalifa, and also being the one that invited our brother, Dr. Zakir, for this program, and our most distinguished brothers, too, here. On behalf of the organizers, I would like to personally crave your indulgence and understanding because of the crowded nature of this hall because you have crammed into this hall in a number that's much more than the capacity of the hall because everybody wanted to see, not to hear, to see Dr. Zakir Naik because if he was to hear, you would have said at home as you have handsets so you are crowded here. It's a bit inconveniencing, but alhamdulillah for this day, you are all, you all trooped out here to be part of this very special program. So I'd like to thank you for your patience and holding on as I will rush to finish this program in the next 40 minutes, inshallah. According to the program, the organizers, led by Sadok Sakoto, gave me 20 minutes to speak. So I'm going to take my 20 minutes. I won't go more than 20 minutes because there are so many things I have to say, and they are very important. But I'd like to thank Almighty Allah for this day and for bringing us to Sokoto. So many of you came from far distance places to honor this day especially Dr. Zakir Naik. I know what it took him to be in Sokoto and the chairman of the occasion, the Emir of Zazo, and our recipients who came from Abuja and Bidda and other places. We'd like to thank you most sincerely for accepting to be with us and we thank Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your lives because you have been doing a lot. All what's been said by the previous speakers especially Sadaf Sakoto, who told us why we are here, what we are here for, which is the culmination of the week-long program. I won't even say week-long, I can say two-week-long program because for the past two weeks, we've been having so many programs and we are all educated. And education is the best weapon you can give any believer. So Alhamdulillah for this program, and I'd like to thank all those who had a hand one way or the other in educating our people for this past one week or so. And I'd like to thank Dr. Zakir Naik also again uh, for coming to this 10th Osman Lamfordio week, also the third year that we've had a hand fully by being here pre uh, uh, personally and created awards to bring together the Muslim Ummah. Why do we invite renowned preachers from outside Nigeria to come to Sokoto for this program? The answer is simple. Islam is one everywhere across the world. And as Muslims, we have the right to invite fellow Muslims to come and interact with us, to educate us more, to know more about us, as they go back to be our ambassadors and speakers in the other parts of the world where they live. 
I remember last year we brought, we brought Abdul Hakim Quick from Canada. And when he went back to Canada, he delivered a very powerful khutbah at the Jumu'at prayers. Very, very instructive. And he sent us copies and we passed around. If he had not come, he wouldn't have seen what Sokoto is. He wouldn't have had that knowledge to talk about Sokoto Caliphate and Uthman Nafodio. Today, Alhamdulillah, we have a world-renowned Dr. Zakir Naik, whom I have known for the past 11 years. We first met in Mecca during Umrah, and we got talking, and he came to see me, and we discussed. That was 11 years ago. He came to Nigeria 10 years ago, but today he's our guest in Sokoto. So Sokoto is happy to receive you, Dr. And hope you come back again and again whenever we invite you. The issue is simple. We are Muslims, and alhamdulillah, we are very proud to be Muslims. And we thank Almighty Allah for making us Muslim, creating us Muslims, and bringing us into this part of the world. And nothing else could change our views about Islam and about what we should do. We are working for Islam and nothing else. We are not working for anybody. And that's why whenever we meet as Muslim leaders, we must tell ourselves the home truth. We are Muslims by Allah's divine will, and nobody could change it. And we are very happy and proud. Some people don't want us to speak, but we will speak. <laughs> Maybe I would have used my military voice in those days <laughs> when I was a soldier commanding parade on parade ground. But now it's a different game. I have to use a microphone, and Dr. Zaki Naik said this microphone is better than yesterday's. So that is technology. So alhamdulillah for being Muslims and we thank Almighty Allah and we continue to praise him and worship him, him and only him alone. We have had an instructive, very beautiful lecture by Dr. Zakir Naik and I'm sure a lot of people across the world must have heard the same thing. What he said is the plain truth according to Islamic principles and tenets and according to his own knowledge as somebody who is into dawah activities and nothing more about that. So those who are thinking that he's going to say something different should have a rethink. What he said is educating Muslims and non-Muslims alike what Islam is and what Islam is not. So Alhamdulillah for this day, and I want to thank all of you for coming, and I won't go too much into uh, other discussions of this nature, because it's already after two o'clock, and I have said, have them been given 10 minutes, I will use my 10 minutes. But the point is that we have no apology to anybody that we invited one of our own as a Muslim, as a Muslim preacher to come and talk to us about Islam and the Quran, and we'll do it again and again. Because we believe in what we tell one another. We have to tell ourselves the home truth. The doctor just said we have to tell the truth if it's against you or your parents or your friends. So, we want to thank you most sincerely. Some of the good behaviors of any Muslim, I believe, are honesty, integrity, and fear of Almighty Allah. For a Muslim to be a good Muslim, there are so many, but these three, I believe, they hold, they are at the front. And that's why September last year, 20, about 23rd September, one Nigerian, one Muslim brother had a lot of money 
left in his kekena pep in Kano. As a good Muslim, what did he do? He went to radio station. He said, somebody was in my, was in my kekena pep, and he left this money. He returned the money. I wonder what we had. Even that night, they had to take Gary to sleep. But he didn't take that money. The conscience of Islam pricked him and said, look, let me return this money. And for that reason, we believe we must bring him out to you here to see him and for us to thank him. For us to thank him and tell him, yes, we are proud of you as our son, as a fellow Muslim who did that. And we will not tell anybody what we are going to give you. But you being here, being brought to the public here, we also have a little paper that you will keep laminate and say, this is from Sultan that I signed it, thanking you, thanking Allah for your life, and calling on other Muslims also to follow the same, so the same road you, you took. So why is, uh, why is the young man? Why is he? I want to bring, uh, I think, Sali Suko. I want Sali Suko. Come to the front here. Today we brought him from Cairo for you to see him, for us to thank him for being a good Muslim, Muslim, and a Muslim with integrity, and we want to wish you all the best, and we will continue to work with you. We will call you privately, not publicly, to see what we can do for you. We don't want to tell everybody, we don't want the bandits to go after you. But we will give you a paper for you to go and show everybody that yes, you are here, you shook the hands of Sultan. You took picture with him. He gave you a piece of paper. You took the hands of Emir Abzazo, the governor of Kebi, governor of Sokoto, governor of Zamfara, and of course, SNP. And then our main guest, Sheikh Dr. Zakir Naik. So, I'm going to talk to you about the people who are in the world. I'm going to talk to you about the people who are in the world. I'm going to talk to you about During the last Hajj, one Hajjah, they call her Enna Huche, picked about $8,000 cash, $8,000 cash in Saudi Arabia. And she took the money back to the Hajj Commission of Zamfara. The money was traced to somebody and was returned to that person. That Hajjah, it also here, we brought her for you to see her, and we thank her for, you to, for her to know what she did is exemplary, and she's our daughter. In other sarki ba Another we must always to be I mean try to be good.
The last point I'm going to speak. I always speak. The last point I'm going to speak about, the award. I instituted the award three years ago. We call the awards with Man and Fodio Award for leadership. And the first winners were Professor Sheo Galadenchi at this very hall. Last year's winner, Sheikh Abakan Mahmoud Gumi, posthumously. And this year, we are giving it to no other person than Sheikh Isia Kurabiu, posthumously because of our relationship with him for the work he, had been, he did for Islam and his family members are still doing for Islam. So he is the year's, this year's winner of this award. The second is the Sheikh Abdullah Fodio Award for scholarship. Our own Sheikh Isat Latin Mafara is known very well across the world. He had been reading and writing and teaching Uthman and Fodio books and other Islamic subjects. This year he is the winner of Sheikh Abdullah Fodio Prize for scholarship. It was won first by Sheikh Ahmad Lemu posthumously. Sheikh Sharif Saleh last year and this year Sheikh Muhammad Isat Latin Mafara. The third prize is Sultan Muhammad Biello Prize for governance, for good governance. Governance in the sense that we as Muslims, we consider governance as a very, very important thing. A leader must hold on to certain ideals of good governance. When we instituted it, the first winner was the Sheikh of Borno, and the second winner was late Emir of Kano, Alaja Ado Bayero. And this year's winner, is no other than my own friend, my own colleague in the army, in the armored corps, a general like me, the Ed Onupe, and the chairman of Niger State Council of Traditional Rulers. And the fourth award is Nana Asma'o's award, which was won first by Professor Adia, and then Hajia Latifa Okunu of Lagos last year, former deputy governor. And this year, it goes to Professor Khadija Nuhu from Kano. Then the fifth award is my own personal award because we named it Sultan Saad Abakar Award for Peace. Last year's award, or the first, award, the first winner was Abdul Latif Adebite of Blessed Memory. And the last year's winner was Fuad Ademi, whom you all know very well. And this year's award is no other person than Professor Ishaq Oloyede, the famous registrar of JAMB who returned billions and billions of naira, who caught, who caught a snake that's one lot 36 million naira. Today he's the winner because of his role as president of Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs, very, very close to me. I personally picked all these awards, all those who are going to be awarded today. And the last one, the public one and only, I think the one and only public who was head of service of the Federation, who was secretary of the government of the Federation, who was minister of defense of the Federation. Three appointments, no, no, no other person ever held these three appointments. So the, the winner this year is no other than Mahmoud Yali Ahmed, Aji and Katagum. So these are the winners, and I've been close to all of them, and I could vouch for their integrity, and yes, they deserve to be given these awards. These awards come with little token. To most of them, the little token I'm giving is from my heart, it's personal, but I know so many of them have trillions of that. But I know they will take it home. I'm tired of buying Allah when the Basuda, so that's the award and the prizes. I would like to call on the governors of Sokoto Kebiz and Fara and the chairman to join me here so that we give these awards to these six distinguished uh, uh, Muslim leaders in this country. Sheikh Osman Danfodio Award for Leadership. It goes to Sheikh Isiak Rabiu posthumously.
Sheikh Abdullah Fodio. Sheikh Isa Talata, Talata Mafara, I will request the governor of uh, KB State to award this. No, I will, I will hold on. I will give a... Uh, okay, it's a live audio. It's a live audio, yes. So the governor of KB will do the justice to that because he is the KB State man. And now, Chris, why is it? Malang, Kadona. Kadona, Kadona, Kadona. Yeah, what? Uh, the next one is... Uh, Baga Doji, Eso Nupe, Malam Dendo. He has the prize of good governance. You need to go to Bida Emre to see what he's doing, how he has, he has moved the whole populace. In terms of security and otherwise, we are, we are witnesses to that. And good enough, we are in the, we are in the same Amorco, and uh, we are now in the same boat. The governor of uh, Zamfara State will give the award. That was the general salute for a general. For you civilians who don't know what it is, that's general salute. It's only done to generals, not to civilians. The next award is for Professor Khadija Nuhu, the Nana Asmao Award. While well, she was presented by her own colleagues and will be given by the Emir of Zazao. Thank you very much. So the last one, no, the second to the last, the Sultan Saad Prize for Leadership, Professor Ishaq Oloede. Imbati, Imbati. Welcome to Sokoto. To be given by the, I don't want, give, I don't want the governor of Sokoto to give. I have my reason. He will be given again by the governor of uh, KB. Or let me just give it to him for, for reasons best known to me.
the last one, and a very prominent one, the public servant of public officers, Aji and Katabu, Ali Ahmed, to be given by the governor of Sokoto State. If it, what you don't know, Yael Ahmed is the father of governor of Sokoto State. And that's why I said I will leave that one for the governor to give. If we were to be here, he would have been jumping with joy that he's given his father this award. So we will request the governor of Sokoto to give the award. I would like to thank all of you for honoring us. Please take your seat so that we just round up. After this, we'll have a group photograph with the winners of the award at the end of this. So I would like to thank you for your patience. And I would like to thank you for your patience for being part of history and we pray for a successful journey back to various destinations. We will have two goodwill messages from the governor of Zamfara and the governor of Kebi before the final message from the governor of Sokoto State. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. At Takbir. Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillah, we congratulate the recipient and we thanks His Eminence for this gesture. Jazakumullah khair. Please, those who are standing within the vicinity of the hall should please vacate. Don Allah do what and that's a key word in Nancy Peter. Don Allah, I pita the guess a key who healing. Your Excellencies, Your Highness, I would like to invite the Governor of KB Street, His Excellency. For the goodwill messages, one of the recipients and indeed former secretary to the federal government of the federation would forward an appreciation of, on behalf of other recipients. Alaji Ali Ahmad. Audhu billahi sabiul alimina shaitan rajim Bismillah rahman rahim Your Excellencies the governors of Sokoto, Kebbi, and Zampara states, your eminence, the Sultan of Sokoto, your royal highnesses, our distinguished guest speaker, Sheikh Zakir Abdul Karim Naik, the founder and the president of Islamic Research 
and the Peace Television. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it would appear that as the youngest recipient, I am tasked with expressing our profound appreciation to His Eminence, the Sultan of Sokoto, for this wonderful and exalted honor done to all of us. In particular, I am grateful to Esu Nipe, who directed me to come on his behalf and on behalf of the other four species to talk and to thank the Caliphate and its leader. Certainly, we Muslims must always be proud of our religion. And despite whatever Allah will give us on this earth, if we are shy of identifying ourselves as true Muslims, we are doing great disservice to this nation. Therefore, we have no apology of being Muslims. And we have no apology of enhancing the qualities of Islam anywhere. And we are equal to the task in this nation and other nations that so long as we survive, we will identify unapologetically with the tenets of Islam. We will never compromise the teachings of Islam. We are very grateful that we have a leader in this country who is up and doing, always traveling far and wide the horizons of this beautiful country to exercise his mandate and authority of being the commander of the faithful. Your eminence, the Muslim community of this country are solidly behind you. We like to extend our total loyalty to the service of Islam under your very able leadership. This honor done to us is not done to us individually, but selected to permeate the whole fabric of being good leaders and good Muslims without apology. Sir, we will eternally be grateful, and through you, please extend our appreciation to the governors of Sokoto, Kepi, and Zampara states, because here is the nucleus of the caliphate. Finally, even though he has been thanked wonderfully, I would like to express our appreciation to our guest lecturer. Our guest lecturer, Dr. Nak, he is undoubtedly at this point in time of Islamic development a special gift to Islam from Allah the Almighty. May Allah continue to give you the courage to say the wonderful words of Allah without fear or fever. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, with the recipients and our deeds and honorees will ever eternally be grateful to the Sultan. I thank you all on our behalf. Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the former uh, Secretary to the Federal Government of Nigeria. And with that, I would like to invite for goodwill message, the governor of Zampara State, heavily represented by his deputy, His Excellency Mani Malam Mama, uh, Malam Mumuni Masamar Mudi, Matawal Lembukuyu. You are invited, sir. Auzubillahi minash-shaitanir-rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim.
Jama Aslam Alekum Niza in the house, don't do Kanjama Amu, the Negida and Akakara, Suji Abenda Munkazo, you know. May Alparma Sarkim Musulmi Babana Alasa Abakar Maya Maya Sarakuna, the Kewanda Uri Governor Jaha Sabkoto. Our killing Governor Jaha, our killing Governor Jaha Governor Jaha Kebi, my Gidamu, Sauram, Maya Malumai, Musama, one Aka, one day by a lecture, Sheikh Zakir Naik, Allah is a commercial Al Hedi. Ah, Babun is Ampara, Amadez and Para, Kogomatins and Parashini, Maya Girana, Doctor Doda, Lowell, Ya Omurcheni, the Sasa and Bolo in Zonan, Domi in Samoka Nana, Amadez has Zampara. Dom Mugadi, Yadamu, Da Bada Goyam Bayamu, the son of Mahimanchi, one I can the Akayo, Namasuluchi, Allah, Saka, Masuka Shirashi, Al Hedi. May Alpha Master Kimus will be Musa Halawa, the Libos, the Limakitana, the one in Gida, Mikitana, the Ku, Kumamunsa, I can hokay by one Kasa, Musama, Ni, Mani, Mala, Mumu, one day to the one again, you actually must have one of the Masama Moody, Allah, Allah, Marasala, Allah, Saka, Mukul Al Hedi. Sugar Bonus Kashule one now, Uri, Kosuka Shule one now, Aiki, Bak and my Aiki Sukaiba, Dukang upon the Sukai Donchi, the Sada one now, Uri, Suma Allah Sakamasad Al Hedi, Amara Ninja has Soka and Gonta Jahazam Para, the Loma Jahazam Para, Manabara going back, the Libosadi, Kumamuya, the Aiken, the Ankana Al Hedi, Kuma Allah Esa, Ya, Ya, the Jukoki number one and Bao Allah Shaks one and so, I can already come over the Mungo de Kore Allah Saka Al Hedi. Masha Allah, Muna Godia, my Girma Mate, my King Gomna. And with that, I would like to invite the next person to deliver his goodwill message the Governor of Zampara State, uh, the Governor of Kebi State, His Excellency Nasir Idris. Kaurang uh, Gwandu, comrade, sir. I was with him in a shade and the invisible light of man here. Your Excellencies, the Governor of Sokoto and Zampara State, His Eminence, the Sultan of Sokoto, the Emirs of Zazau, Bida, and other Emirs that are presently here, other royal fathers distinguished members, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon all. Uh, let me first and foremost thank the organizers of this very August occasion. And also to thank His Eminence for supporting the organizers and ensure that this gathering is an excellent one. And also to thank Dr. Naif, Dr. Zakir Naif, for coming all the way from Malaysia to Sokoto to give us this lecture. I want to thank him and also to tell him that we are together. This lectures is a very nice one. 
and uh, we have got so many input and goodies that we will take back home. Your Eminence, like all of us know that the Sokoto, Kebi, and Zampara are the same. The Sokoto that give birth to Kebi and Zampara State. And also, you can't separate the Sokoto Calipet and the Gwandu. They are all the same. Promoting Islamic that you have been doing for the benefit of Nigeria and globally at all. I want to assure you that anytime this type of occasion is to take place, the organizers should not hesitate to contact us so that we will contribute because anything that will make Islam to progress who will not hesitate to put hands, our hands inside so that the aim and the objective will be achieved. Mosul, our people that came from various places to witness these very important lectures, I want to seize this opportunity to thank them and I pray that Almighty God should take everybody back to his burial some safely. Thank you and God bless all of us. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. With this, I have the honor to invite the representative of Chief Host and the Executive Governor of Sokoto State, Dr. Ahmad Aliyu, Sokoto FCNA, ably represented by the Secretary to the State Government for Governor's Speech. Auzu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim wa sallallahu ala nabiyil karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Your Eminence the Sultan of Sokoto and the President General Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs Your Excellency the Governor of Kebbi State and Comrade your Excellency, the representative of the governor of Kebi State, and my good friend, Mali Masamamudi, Your Royal Highnesses, the Emir of Zezo and uh, Mena, Kagara, and other prominent chiefs, the guest speaker, Professor Zakir Naib, the recipients of the awards, ulamas, guests, my colleagues, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuhu. I primarily stand here to represent my governor, Dr. Ahmed Ali Sokoto, PhD, FCNN, who is unavoidably absent and had wanted to be in this important gathering, but because of other equally important engagements, he traveled and asked me to represent him. The governor is profoundly joyous to welcome everybody to this important gathering. On the occasion of Tens Sheikh Usman Namfodio week, year 1445, 
the repositioning and revitalizing of Islamic knowledge is one of the nine point agenda of His Excellency Ahmad Ali Sokoto. His belief is that of all the things and services government provide, education and pursuit of knowledge deserve much support. And the reason is obvious.